2.45 a.m., Monday, the 6th of August, 1945. We took off that morning without issue from the island of Tinian, the two other B-29s at our tail. We were en route to the city of Hiroshima, Japan. The tail gunner called, here it comes. I had a peculiar taste, electrolysis, in my mouth, and I saw a bright hue. It was a very sobering event, as we turned back over the target to take camera photos of the area. A boiling, tumbling, rolling cloud rose up from the ground. The cloud went up rapidly and was 10,000 feet above us and climbing by the time we had turned around. Down below, all you could see was a black, boiling mist. I didn't think about what was going on down on the ground. You need to be objective about this. I didn't order the bomb to be dropped, but I had a mission to do. In December 1938, while Germany was under Nazi rule, the German radio chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann experimented with bombarding elements with neutrons in their Berlin laboratory. They found that the nuclei of uranium had split into two roughly equal halves. The resulting pieces did not have the same mass as the original uranium. Because of Einstein's energy mass equivalence principle, commonly known as E equals mc squared, it follows that because mass had been lost, energy had been released. Indeed, a great amount of energy had been released. Calculations done by Lise Meitner concluded that a radically new process had been discovered, nuclear fission. Meitner and Otto Frisch theorized that this energy could be released in a controlled way which would start a chain reaction and create an extremely powerful explosive force. They had just predicted the invention of the atomic bomb. A few months after this, Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard sent a letter to the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, warning that the Germans may attempt to create an atomic bomb. In response, Roosevelt established the Uranium Committee, a group of top scientific and military minds that had the purpose of determining the possibility of such a weapon. In the spring of 1941, the MAUD Committee, the British equivalent of the Uranium Committee, reported that atomic weaponry was feasible and asked for cooperation with the United States to develop them. Vannevar Bush was appointed as head of the U.S.'s newly created Office of Scientific Research and Development. Eventually, Bush concluded that the office did not have the resources to sustain development, so the Army was brought in for support. The Manhattan Project was formally created on August 13, 1942. General Leslie R. Groves, the head of the project, decided to name it after where it was originally contained, Manhattan Island. The official name was the Manhattan Engineer District, but was shortened as the Manhattan Project. The project's main weapons development laboratory was in Los Alamos, New Mexico. J. Robert Oppenheimer was appointed as head of the lab and would oversee the rest of the research and construction of the bomb. Thousands of workers were drafted into the project and all were made residents of the secret town. Also, the army was tasked with supplying and protecting the town and all of the confidential work being done there. In the beginning, work was slow and uncertain. General Groves recounts a meeting he had with project scientists in 1942. He states that the estimate for how much radioactive material they required for a reaction was within a factor of 10. To illustrate, Say the scientists estimated that 100 kilograms of material was needed. The actual amount could be anywhere between 10 and 1,000 kilograms. During the development of the bomb, two triggering mechanisms were designed. The first design was a gun type, which propelled one piece of radioactive material into another. This type uses uranium and was used in Little Boy. The bomb dropped over Hiroshima. The other type, the implosion type detonator, involves the use of carefully timed explosions that met in the middle where the radioactive material was. This type uses plutonium and was used in Fat Man, the bomb dropped over Nagasaki. By 1945, after years of research and development, preparations for the first test were finished. The device, simply named the Gadget, had the implosion type detonator. The scientists were unsure of the reliability of this detonator type so it was decided that it would be used in a full-scale test. 
The site chosen for the test was in a corner of the Alamogordo bombing range, an area known as Journey of Death. Oppenheimer named this test Trinity after the poems of John Donne. In the early morning of July 16th, as the gadget was hoisted 100 feet into the air, tensions rose with it. Groves and Oppenheimer were separated in case of an accident, and the device was armed. As the time ticked away, fears were heightened. Fears, of course, of what might happen when the device detonates. General Groves, however, was more fearful of what might happen if the device doesn't detonate. Over the bunker's PA system comes a voice, counting down the seconds. Most observing staff lay with their feet towards the bomb and wait. Three, two, one. At precisely 5.30 a.m., the bomb was successfully detonated. The nuclear age had begun. The effects could be called unprecedented, magnificent, beautiful, stupendous, and terrifying. No man-made phenomenon of such tremendous power had ever occurred before. The whole country was lighted by a searing light with the intensity many times that of the midday sun. It was golden, purple, violet, gray, and blue. It lighted every peak, crevice, and ridge of the nearby mountain range with a clarity and beauty that cannot be described, but must be seen to be imagined. The next month, a bomb was loaded onto the Enola Gay, a B-29 bomber. This aircraft's mission was to drop the atomic bomb Little Boy over Hiroshima, where it would become the first nuclear weapon to be used against another nation. As the aircraft sliced through the atmosphere above Japan, the crew prepares the bomb. It was decided that the bomb would become armed after takeoff due to the possibility of a premature explosion. When the Enola Gay reached the target height above Hiroshima, a final check was issued. Two small corrections were made, and then the bomb was released. What follows is a 43 second fall. When the bomb reaches 600 yards above the city, it will detonate. This explosion will be of a magnitude the same as 20,000 tons of TNT. It will generate a fireball 300,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Almost every single building within two miles will be obliterated. 80,000 people will be killed. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Although the Manhattan Project created one of the most deadly weapons ever conceived by humans, it also created the potential for scientific growth and nuclear power. The project broke significant boundaries in science, essentially laying the groundwork for an entire field of study, nuclear science. As Halkun Chevalier wrote in a letter to Oppenheimer, I know that with your love of man, it is no light thing to have had a part, and a great part, in a diabolical contrivance for destroying them. But in the possibilities of death are also the possibilities of life. Hakun sees that the project did more than just create a weapon, but has opened doors to even more scientific discovery. It is impossible to ignore, however, the negative products that have come out of it. By breaking down this scientific barrier, the project created a social and political barrier that comes from the fear of atomic weapons. One major example of this political barrier was the Cold War which was at least indirectly caused by the Manhattan Project.